again. You guys can be seated. <clears throat> With this uh, idea of getting sick, let me say, I'm just going to basically share three uh, reasons I believe people get sick, basically, based on, based on Scripture. Ba basically, three reasons and common sense <laughs> that people get sick. And I want you to think about this. Okay, number one, uh, Brother Justin just read Genesis chapter 3. And, uh, and I would say that number one reason that people get sick is it's part of the original curse upon the earth, okay? And what, here's another word for that. Nature. <laughs> a lot of times when we say nature, we're thinking, oh, the way God created things. No, most things that we call nature aren't actually the way God originally created things, but they're the way things, things work since the fall of man. Since we live in a cursed earth now, this is nature. This is the way nature goes, right? And some of those things like, uh, you know, survival of the fittest and stuff like the, this atheist, they, they, they try to take God out of the picture and they have all these ideas ideas. And, and you know what? Some of those are kind of true because these naturalists are studying nature and they're right. There are certain things and laws that exist in nature. And of course, we know from the Bible where some of those things came from, where they started. But the fact is that there is a curse upon the earth. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth, unto, uh, forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. From dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return." Now you say, well, there's nothing in there that really says anything about getting sick, and that's true. But if you kind of think this through, here's what we get from the fall of man. Everybody's going to die, right? Now, according to the Bible, according to this uh, text here, uh, not everybody was going to die uh, back in Genesis chapter 2. Look back at chapter, ch chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, uh, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight of, uh, and, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So there's two trees growing in the, in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, I'll talk about the tree of life here in a minute. The tree of life, and then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? This is an interesting thing to study out and I, I you know there's a lot of different ideas on what these are but obviously the tree of knowledge of good and evil he said don't eat it he said uh, he said don't eat of it in the day you eat of it what did he say where's i don't know where the actual verse is what am i looking? he said you shall surely die right you shall surely die so which means that up until that point that wasn't something that they had to worry about but when they ate of it, now death came upon the world, okay? So, so we're all going to die. We understand the spiritual application there as well, but the reality is everybody is going to die. Now, there's an interesting thought here. You know, I, I try to think of this like it's, it's hard to imagine how viruses and bacteria and everything would have existed before the fall. I just don't know. Like before the curse on the earth, what were... The what was the point of viruses and bacteria and all and all that? But, you know, whatever the case, and there are actually good bacteria out there. I'm talking about just in the laws of nature as we live and, and move today under these laws. There are good bacteria. Anybody ever eat yogurt? That's got good bacteria in it. <laughs> that's bacteria that's good for you. You should be eating that stuff. Not only that, we need bacteria for our bodies to have an immune system. That's the way God designed us, right? We, we are come in contact with those bacteria, even viruses to some degree, and it strengthens our immunity. It's the way God designed us to be able to, uh, to, to, to function and to get stronger and all that. But, uh, but look at Revelation 21, 
And if we can assume that in Revelation 21, when we talk about the way things are going to be in eternity, and if they're supposed to be like it was in the garden, similar conditions, well, then here's what we can see. Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Isn't that wonderful? We're all looking forward to that time. No more pain of, of losing a loved one. No more illnesses and sicknesses that are going to bring pain and sorrow, sadness. You know, there's not going to be death. There's not going to be crying. And, uh, and what, a, what a wonderful thing to think about. In the meantime, that's not the way it is. We have to endure all those things. We have to go through those things. Uh, but we know that uh, in the beginning, it wasn't that, that way. All right. And like I said, not all, uh, not all bacteria is bad. Not all these things are necessarily bad, but, but we know it's that thing that's going to eventually kill somebody. You know. Now look back at Revelation <clears throat> chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Okay, so we see this tree of life again. Now, the tree of life, the, the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil is what they ate from, right? Adam and Eve ate from that tree, and that's where they got the curse. And you remember then God says he's going to send cherubim to guard the tree of life, you know, so, so that they can't go back to it and eat from that tree and live forever. And in your mind, I, I don't know, probably like me, I've tried to reason it out many times. Well, maybe it's symbolic or something like that. In my mind, I've always thought, like, well, what would happen then if they found that tree and they ate from it? Would, would they really be able to beat the curse? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there's a curse. Everyone's going to die. Would they really be able to beat that? And then the other question is, well, it makes you think, well, back in the Garden of Eden, did they have to eat that to be able to continue to have eternal life? Well, that doesn't really make sense because, you know, he says, in that day, ye shall surely die. Well, if they hadn't sinned yet, then there was no ye shall surely die. They had the life. So I don't know. Uh, how God used the tree of life to sustain them and give them eternal life. There's a mystery, okay, uh, behind that. But all we know is that that tree of life was in the garden. That tree of life is in heaven, you know, <laughs> in all eternity. We're going to have access to that, and we're not going to have to worry about dying uh, because we're going to have that, that tree of life. Now, obviously, they had the tree of life before the fall, but it was after they sinned, and now the punishment was that they're going to die that God said, don't want them to have access to the tree of life, okay? But, but in heaven, again, at that point we're saved, we have eternal life. And so, we you know, whether there's some kind of symbolism there or not, the idea is that we have this eternal life, okay, uh, from that point on. I mean, I think it's a real tree of life, and I think it's a real river of, of life as well. But So, a little bit of a mystery there, but, but the, the point is that, you know, there's a curse upon the earth, and in the way that nature works, we understand everybody's going to die. I, I've, I have knocked on people's doors or talked to individuals who said that they no longer believe in God. Well, that's unfortunate, man. What happened? Why did you stop believing in God? And I've, on many occasions, maybe you have too, had somebody say, well, I was praying for so-and-so, my loved one, my, my grandpa or something like that. And I was praying that God would heal him and he didn't heal him and he got sick and he died. And so I don't believe in God anymore. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty foolish logic. <laughs> I mean, because it's inevitable. We already know whether you believe the Bible or not, everybody's going to die. So what do you expect? God was just going to miraculously save that grandpa from ever dying? You know, but everyone else has to die. But grandpa, he gets to keep on living forever and ever. We know that doesn't happen. So, that, so there's no logic there. Uh, but the question is why? You know, the question people want to know, why do you have to die? Well, you know, again, that's part of the curse. That's the way that God set it up. And, uh, and now we must actually die. Now, look, some people are going to die the second death. And they're going to be in the lake of fire for all eternity. 
Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case. But, uh, but, but other than that, everybody is going to die, and we as Christians have to die. If we didn't die, we would be stuck in this terrible body for eternity. <laughs> this is, we'd be stuck in, this, in, in nature as it is right now for eternity. Yeah, that would be misery. That would be like hell in itself, <laughs> living this life for all eternity. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not really uh, going to be that great of a thing. Okay, so we actually have to die so that we can get our glorified body. Right, look at uh, uh, Romans 8. I know, I mean, it's kind of like Apostle Paul is like, I'm ready to go be with the Lord. You know, but he says, but at the same time, I've got things to do in this life. God wants me here. I've got a purpose. He's got things that he wants me to do. You know, we have to remember that. There's that within us. It's like, hey, I want to go to, I want to go to heaven now. I mean, why not take my own life? Anybody ever thought about that or kind of reason that? You don't want to really say it out loud, but you're like, well, if I could commit suicide, still go to heaven. Why don't I take my life? Well, because now if you got family, obviously there's a little more incentive there. My family needs me. I love them. I want to take care of them. If you got, um, you know, things you want to accomplish in your life, maybe you're just motivated, which we all as Christians should be by those who are going to die and go to hell if we don't go give them the gospel. And so you're like, I got to do the work that God's called me to do. I think that's what Paul was saying. Hey, look, it's more needful for me to be here right now. But I know that regardless, one day I'll be in heaven uh, forever. But here's what Romans 8 says, 8, chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with Him, and we, uh, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, with uh, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for, I preached this morning in Iola, on the uh, recompense uh, in the, uh, in the, the, what is it called, the... Resurrection of the just, the recompense uh, for in the resurrection of the just. So, so look, we lay up treasures in heaven. We invest in things that are going to be for all eternity because we know that one day there's going to be a resurrection. We're going to receive our rewards, right? And so, uh, but we also know when we suffer pain, when we have sicknesses, when we lose loved ones or whatever, we 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 realize that all that stuff has to happen. But one day, our hope. Is the, uh, is the hope of the redemption of our bodies, okay? And in 24 it said, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what, is, uh, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which uh, we see not, that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it, okay? So it's going to take patience, and it's going to take times of getting sick and going through things we don't want to have to go through, pain we don't want to go through, uh, you know, some pain we inflict upon ourselves, like running 100 miles, but other pains, you know, we don't have a choice. <laughs> Those just come and they uh, and we have to deal with them. It's unfortunate. But, you know, even if I had some special powers that God gave me, uh, apostolic powers to go heal these people that are sick, they're still going to have to get sick someday because they're going to die. Yep. And they got to die. We can't keep them alive forever in this current state. All right, so it's inevitable that people get sick and that people die. I don't I like it, but that is just one reason. Okay, one reason is that there's a curse upon the earth. It's just a general natural rule that is just going to happen since the fall of man. Number two, number two, why people get sick. There is such a thing as getting sick as a judgment upon sin, a judgment upon an individual who is in sin, a judgment upon a nation, a judgment upon 
basically any wickedness. God has the right, and he does pour out his judgment upon uh, a person or people. And for that reason, some people are sick. It used to scare me to death. Every year we would do the Lord's Supper, and they would read that about people that take it unworthily, and they say, for this reason, some among you are sick. And I was like, oh, man, what if I... Uh, what what if I'm the reason for people getting sick, <laughs> right? I don't think that's exactly what it mean what it what it's talking about. But I remember thinking, what if I take this unworthily, you know, because I'm like living in sin or something? Now I think that's going too far. I don't think that's the application of what he's talking about in that passage of scripture. But you know, God does judge us for sin, and it very well could be. And I'm not I'm not saying this is the case. I'm I, my my. Message is just why people get sick, okay? But uh, we can make any application to ourselves. But what if, I mean, think about that. What if me living in sin would cause my family or a church or whatever, you know, for there to be people that are sick? I mean, if I knew that that was a possibility and that that could be going on, you, you would hope that would make me think, man, I need to get my life together. I don't want my friends and my family and my church members to have to go through sickness and all that as a judgment you know, for sin, you would think that our whole nation would cry out and say, what could God be judging us for? You know, <laughs> you know, why is Trump and Biden the best hope that our government, I mean, our nation has? It's not, by the way, <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, why is our nation suffering so many crazy things? I know the whole world is, is, is struggling right now, but, but why all these things? Well, it very well could be that we're aborting babies, very well could be that we're just, you know, everyone's pro-homosexuality, pro-LGBT, and if you come out and speak against them, then they're going to censor you and shut you down and, and hate you and say that you're, you know, uh, such a bad person because you don't accept that when you're just preaching the Bible, right? Well, it could be that God is judging people for this condition that we, that we live in. I mean, I think it's reasonable that a lot of people would be sick as a judgment upon God. Now, the problem there is like, well, why would those who don't do those things get sick? But isn't it always kind of like a downfall, like a, a cause? I mean, like, a, I can't think of the word, but sometimes others are affected, you know, because of the judgment upon a nation. That just, that's just inevitable, right? Look at the children of Israel. There were some good guys that were affected because of sins of the whole nation, you know. And, and obviously, there are other times where God would punish a people group and he would totally spare his people. Right, we we all want that, and he does do that sometimes. Everybody else is sick, and yet he's got his people nice and healthy, and they're going out and doing the work that they're supposed to do. I'll be honest with you; I thought that's what God was going to do for us. I mean, and really, we are all healthy, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like uh, we won't get sick. <laughs> We're going to do in the work of the Lord, and we have, and it hasn't stopped. Right, so uh, so praise the Lord for that. But you know, even if there's a judgment upon our nation. And as a result, a lot of people are getting sick. And because of that, some of us get sick. God's still good. We're still recovering from it. You know, uh, if, if it's COVID that everybody has, and I'm looking around at the symptoms, even those who have had it the worst of people that I know right now that are getting sick, it's really not that bad. <laughs> it's really like maybe a headache, maybe like some flu symptoms, some achiness. Loss of a sense of smell and taste. Is that really that bad? Might lose a couple pounds if you can't taste food. You know, That's really not that bad. Okay, Sicknesses can be really bad, but it's inconvenient and nobody likes it. And, it, and obviously there are people that could get worse cases and have worse illnesses. But anyway, the, there is a judgment upon individual sin. Look at James chapter 5. James 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Now, one thing we get from that is simply, you know, we need to be praying for one another. 
And, uh, and certainly it's not wrong to ask for prayer or to go to the elder and say, hey, would you pray for me? That's one thing I love about this congregation right here is, uh, and I forget sometimes, I'm, I'm not thinking about certain things that would be a great opportunity to pray, but even at the Potluck 100, uh, you know, I remember Brother Justin pulled up as Brother Austin and I are still going. He says, hey, let's have prayer real quick. You know, uh, oftentimes somebody would just out of the blue would say, hey, can you pray with me? Or, hey, you want to pray about that? And I'll be walking by every once in a while, I see two people just bowing and praying. And I'm like, that's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to pray for one another, calling on the phone saying, hey, can you pray for me for a minute? I love it. It's great. <clears throat> we don't want to do it in vain or, or make some kind of a, a weird ritual or something like that. But if it's sincere and we're really praying for that, do it. You know, this is what we're called to do. And you know, how many times have we done that? Possibly stop somebody from getting sick. I mean, I don't know. He's saying right here, if you're sick, you know, pray for one another. Uh, and then he says there that it could be if you've committed any sins. It's like if that's the reason that they're sick because they're living in sin and this is God's hand upon them, this chastening hand, you know, it could be that praying for that, getting that sin forgiven, you know, I'm not talking about as far as their eternal salvation. Those sins are all forgiven already once we accept Christ. But in this, uh, in this life, in this sin-cursed earth, uh, we have to get forgiveness of sins to save us physically in this earth. Otherwise, we sometimes get the effects uh, of, that, of that sin and judgment upon those, th those sins. And sometimes it's for our own good to make us better people that we have to get that. That's called the chastening hand of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 and verse 16. I got the wrong one. Somebody help me out. Uh, let's see here. I'm in the right area. This is the chastening hand of God. Verse 6. I don't know why I said 16. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Okay, so if you are receiving chastening from God, that's a good thing. He wants to make you better. He wants to help you out. And so if you know in your heart that I'm living in sin, and you're like, hey, God's punishing me for that. God's, you know, uh, uh, trying to chasten me for that. Well, praise the Lord for that. Be thankful for that. Get your get yourself right, and then see his blessings, and then you, that just strengthens your faith, you know. And you get you get a little bit more emboldened, and and uh, and, and and your faith strengthens. Okay, so the chastening hand of the Lord is uh, is sometimes why somebody might have to go through a sickness or something. Okay, sometimes the uh, judgment of God upon an individual is to stop somebody from causing harm to the work of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians 5, verse, uh, let me see here. Let's go with uh, verse 3. First Corinthians 5, 3. For I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already. Not supposed to judge Paul. <laughs> no, it's all right to judge godly, godly, judge according to the to the word of God. He says, I judge already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. Now listen to this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye when ye are gathered together in my and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, that's, a, that's some powerful words. It's like, it's, I read that as, you know, you know a person, you know they're saved, but they're living in sin, and, uh, and they're, as a result of that, it's, it's like a, a shame on the Word of God. You know, it's, like it's, it's kind of like a mocking God, you know, if you think about it. This person's supposed to be saved. I know people like this. Supposed to be godly people. They got a history of being godly, and now they're living wickedly, living in sin openly. And in my mind, I've always thought, like, what is God doing? I mean, why doesn't God take this person out? <laughs> they're, they're causing all, they're, you know, they're causing harm to the work of God. And I kind of feel like that's what Paul is saying. He was like, I deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, 
that his soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. So like he's, he, he's saved, so let's go ahead and let him spiritually just go to heaven. Let his body be gone, <laughs> you know. Now, I think that in the context here, if you read 2 Corinthians, that this person they're talking about, I think he got right. I think he repented, and, uh, and then it got so bad that Paul had to tell those guys, hey, the guy repented, you know. <laughs> you need to accept him back and, and, and help him, okay? He, he's doing right. I think that's what happened there, but, but the fact is that there are times where people are running so far away from the Lord where it's like, hey, if they're not going to get right, you know, God's got to do something to them, and He's got to take them out. Sometimes that's what the judgment of God is about. Look at 1 John 5. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. <clears throat> and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will... He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions uh, that we desire of Him. Now, just going that far, that parallels James pretty well, doesn't it? What James was saying about, you know, uh, praying for one another, that their sins might be forgiven, they might be healed. Here's what it says, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask... And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin unto death. We know, yeah, that's as far as I need to go for that. So there is, I mean, there's a sin not unto death. So there is a sin unto death, and there's a sin not unto death. You say, how do I know which one it is? I mean, you know, you could look at it and say, well, in the Old Testament, he told us which sins are punishable by death, right? And maybe it would be wrong for us, you know, to pray that God would deliver somebody and maybe he's in jail and uh, he's done a certain sin and, and, and you're just like, hey, that, the punishment of that sin is death, you know, murder or, or, or adultery or something like that. So you wouldn't go to jail for adultery anymore, but, uh, but you understand what I'm saying. That may be the punishment. That's one way you could look at that and say like, hey, that's a sin unto death. I'm not going to pray that God spare her from that and, and, and deliver him from that. Uh, but at the same time, he could just be saying, look, there's a sin. That guy has sinned uh, to a certain point and rejected God to a certain point uh, or, or re rejected the chastening hand of God to a certain point that, hey, his next step is just death, right? <laughs> and I'm not going to uh, uh, pray for that. Maybe we just don't know what that sin unto death is. I don't know. All right. But anyway, uh, the second reason I think people get sick is the judgment upon their sin. Number three, this is pretty simple, but true, and this kind of all of them, all of them could find it kind of fit in with this. Number three is that the works of God should be manifest. Sometimes people get sick so that the work of God can be manifest. Look at uh, uh, John chapter nine. Uh, one story I just love in the Bible, uh, so many of them, but this one I consider one of my favorites when the blind man is is he given his sight. Mostly I like this story because of how he deals with the Pharisees whenever they're like confronting him <laughs> and he's just like letting them have it. And that's what I love about this. But uh, John chapter nine, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. Now, let's see here. That's Luke. John chapter nine. And Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, and you know, we could criticize the disciples for this, but this is, this is the kind of attitude a lot of people have and a question that a lot of people have. What did this, what, who did sin, this man or his parents, that, we, that he was born blind? So somebody could say, I know this might seem like it's going against the second point that I just made, but judgment is certainly a reason uh, why some people are sick. But some people might say, well, look, why are these people sick? Like, who among us sinned and made these people sick? Or, or what did that person do? Why did they get sick? Are they just sinners? You know, or is this the judgment of God? And Jesus said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Okay, so why then? But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So God, Jesus ends up healing this guy. 
And it's a great story. It's a great story. He gets saved, great faith. A lot of people turn to the Lord because this happened. And if he hadn't been blind, that wouldn't have happened. And the other thing about that is this man was blind since birth, which means God knew from the time he was born, hey, one day this blindness is going to uh, you know, lead up to a point where Jesus is going to come heal him and uh, in the glory of God, God's going to get the glory because of this sickness, okay? That kind of makes me think of Paul. Paul had a, uh, an infirmity. We don't know what that infirmity was. But Paul had something that he attributes to God actually allowing him to have it, right? A, a, message of, uh, a messenger of Satan, but it's something that God allowed to have. Let's read that, 2, Timothy, I mean, 2 Corinthians 12. Second Corinthians 12, and verse 7. <clears throat> and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of, this re uh, of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And so I, I think it's quite possible one way that God could receive glory in a time of people getting sick is it keeps us humble. So it could be that he will receive glory because of the fact he brings something out of it. Something happens, whether, you know, he miraculously heals somebody or does something to help, uh, help people and uh, he gets the glory for that. Or he gets the glory because we are actually humble ourselves because we live with an infirmity. It happens, okay, and, and it's something that uh, that we need to hap happen from time to time. He said, as a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Even Paul says, man, I'm having these revelations, you know, God's really on my side. He's really happy with all the work I'm doing for the Lord, all the people I'm getting saved. And he's like, but then this infirmity, man, I just can't get rid of. And so he says, hey, my grace is sufficient. I'm made strong in your weakness. And, uh, and, and he says he's the one that needs to get the glory from that. Okay, so here's three things to take away. Number one, there's just, it's just nature. There's going to be sickness. We live in a sin-cursed earth. Everybody is going to get sick. You know? Now, some people are going to get a cold, and unfortunately, they got a bad immune system. They're weak. might even kill them. You know, that's unfortunate. We don't want that. We want to stop that from happening. But the, the, but the bottom line is everybody is going to get sick. Why? Because it's just nature. That's just the way that it works. Now, a secondary option is that there is a judgment that God will allow people to get sick in order to uh, make His purposes known, chastening hand of God upon people. Uh, that is definitely a possibility. Number three, simply that the works of God should be made manifest, whether it's humbling us, whether it's just receiving glory, he receives glory for something else on his, uh, uh, that's, that's his will, something that he chose to happen that's beyond our control, and in the end, we give him glory from it. And so con the conclusion of that, like so many sermons are, is Romans 8, 28. You probably know it, but let's read it, because this is the bottom line. You're a child of God, you love the Lord, you're called according to his purposes, well, here's what you can rest assured. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purposes, His purpose. If you are saved and you're a child of God, you know, you can expect, you know, whatever happens is, even if it's a bad situation, you should have the hope that says, hey, this is going to work for good. I don't know how, but as long as I'm loving him and I'm, I'm called according to his purpose and I'm trying to serve him, trying to do his will, if he allows something to happen, he's going to get the glory from it. Good's going to come from it. That's what we know. So, so why are people sick? 
Well, probably just the natural effect of a sin-cursed world. Could be the judgment of sin upon a nation, uh, or particular people even, or it could be that God is just going to get the glory from this thing one way or another. And so we need to believe that. We need to have that hope. But let's pray. Father, we do pray for your, uh, your hand of protection. Uh, we love you. We do know we're called according to your purpose, and we, we do want to serve you, get the job that you called us to done. I pray that you'd help us do that safely and uh, effectively. And I do pray, Lord, that if any um, uh, are sick from a matter of your judgment, that you would make it known uh, what, uh, what needs to be uh, uh, fixed and that you would allow uh, us to, uh, to make that decision and to, uh, and to get that thing right in our, in our lives. Uh, but most likely, this is just a natural effect of, of the nature that we live in, Lord. So I just pray your hand of protection. Uh, get us through that. Let our bodies do what our bodies are made to do and get stronger and build, build our immune system and keep on going. We just keep trusting you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.